If it's Tuesday, the defense rests. Testimony in Donald Trump's historic hush money trial is complete without the former president taking the witness stand as the trial now moves towards closing arguments and jury deliberations. Plus, Donald Trump deletes a social media post which suggested his reelection in November would bring a, quote, united Reich. The Biden campaign now blasting the former president and calling him a threat to democracy. And Rudy Giuliani and multiple other Trump allies faced an Arizona judge over their alleged scheme to overturn the 2020 election as the former president keeps making false claims about the 2020 results and casting doubt on 2024. And welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles on a major day in the first ever criminal trial of a former United States president. After 22 witnesses, more than 80 hours of testimony, and 20 days in court, testimony has concluded. The defense rested this morning after calling just two witnesses. In the courtroom right now, the judge presiding over former President Trump's hush money case, Juan Mershon, is weighing arguments from each side on proposed jury instructions, which jurors will be given after closing arguments next Tuesday. Notably, the defense rested today without calling the former president to the stand, despite Mr. Trump's insistence that he would testify. Yeah, I would testify, absolutely. It's a scam. It's a scam. That's not a trial. That's not a trial. That's a scam. If you read Jonathan Turley, if you read Andy McCarthy, if you le read the legal, they said there's not even a case there. That's election interference by the Biden administration. Yes. Do you plan to testify in court? Uh, probably so. I would like to. I mean, I think so. The final witness in the trial was attorney and former legal advisor to Michael Cohen, Robert Costello, whose conduct on the stand yesterday infuriated Judge Mershon to such a degree that he cleared the courtroom to admonish the witness. Today's cross-examination of Costello was less heated. Prosecutors used Costello's emails to question his credibility and to suggest he was working to protect Donald Trump. Yesterday, Costello testified that Cohen denied Trump was aware of the hush money scheme. NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugian joins me from outside the courthouse in Manhattan. Also with me are former assistant Matt Manhattan District Attorney Jeremy Saland and Chuck Rosenberg, a former U.S. attorney and former senior FBI official who's now an NBC News legal analyst. All right, Yasmin, uh, let's start with you. Uh, obviously, a lot of heat around Robert Costello's testimony yesterday. It was pretty contentious, to say the least. Was the mood a little more subdued today? Yeah. More subdued today, but but yesterday was not subdued at all. So uh, can't quite get more sub more um, contentious than we saw yesterday between uh, Robert Costello and, and especially Judge uh, Juan Mershon. He, he was not on the stand for that long um, this morning, Ryan. Just about uh, an hour or so uh, of testimony um, with, with Robert Costello. I imagine the defense is kind of thinking about whether or not it was um, the appropriate decision to call Robert Costello to the stand because of some of what he offered, especially. Uh, during cross-examination in which, and I'll, and I'll mention this one instance in which Susan Hoffinger essentially asked him, did you at one point say you felt as if Michael Cohen was was playing you um, and your firm when it came to ret retaining you as an attorney? And, and Robert Costello said no. And then Susan Hoffinger brought up the very email in which Robert Costello wrote, I believe Michael Cohen is playing us. And that was um, in 2018 when, in fact, he was um, trying to be retained by Michael Cohen. And so I think it seemed as if Robert Costello's testimony, um, while he was called as a witness for the defense, made Michael Cohen seem more of a credible witness than anything, only because Michael Cohen, when testifying in the stand in direct and talking about Robert Costello, talked about the fact that he wasn't a trustworthy individual, hence one of the reasons why he decided not to retain him and did not tell him the truth at the time of what he believed happened. And, and we saw that on the stand over the last two days of testimony from the defense's witness, Robert Costello, Ryan. So, Yasmin, we know uh, that the judge and the two sides are hammering out the jury instructions. Uh, that conference is uh, still taking yeah. place, I believe. Uh, have there been issues that we know have gotten resolved or addressed? What's the status there? So, so um, unless we've all gone to law school, and I'm sure Chuck can w talk more about this than I can, um, it, it's hard to really understand and grasp um, what exactly is going on in the courtroom here when it comes to these charging instructions, partially because we don't have in our hands the draft of these charging instructions that they're going through, right? 
both the prosecution and the defense have put together their suggestions for the charging instructions, the jury instructions that will then go out to the jury after summations happen on um, Tuesday when court resumes. And so one of the things that seems as if was the sticking point, I'm sure the attorneys on the panel can talk more about this, was about um, intent to defraud and, and the importance of defining um, Donald Trump's role in that intent to defraud in these charging instructions. That was a sticking point um, when it comes to these charging instructions. One thing I will say, though, is I listened to the former president in the hallway when they resumed court at 2.15, and he talked about how this decision lies solely, ultimately, with the judge, as we all well know, Judge Juan Marchand. He's getting these suggestions from both the prosecution and the defense, but ultimately it lies with the judge himself. And he is already saying, for instance, that he could see the judge here manufacturing a crime, right, setting up for what could come after we get a decision from this jury, wanting to place the blame here on the judge, but also understanding the gravity, as we all do, and the nature of these jury instructions as they go into deliberations, Ryan. Okay, Yasmin, thank you for that. So let's go to our legal panel of Jeremy and Chuck. Um, Chuck, uh, first to you, and I, I wonder, because there, even though it seems as though this case has been talked about ad nauseum, uh, there's a lot of superfluous information uh, that is, doesn't go directly to what this jury has to decide. Uh, to that point, how important, Chuck, are these jury instructions so that the jury has a clear understanding of what it is they're actually weighing in on here? Well, the jury instructions, Ryan, are very important. Whether or not the jury, at the end of the day, has a clear idea of what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, that always sort of befuddled me a bit as a prosecutor. These, these instructions and this charging conference uh, can be dense and complicated and uh, rather weedy. But at a high level, here's why it matters. The jurors have just heard from 22 witnesses and they've seen scores of documents. Those were the facts adduced at trial. The law which is what the judge will instruct them on following this charging conference, is their roadmap to apply the facts that they have learned in this case. So the way things are defined, the way things are constructed, the way things are explained to the jury by the judge in his instructions are really important. Um, again, at a high level, so as not to sort of overwhelm people with the, the nuance and the detail and the complexity, the government wants a broad definition of liability. Um, of course, the defense is looking for a more narrow one. And this is something that Judge Mershon has to get right um, because this is often an issue on appeal. And so having accurate jury instructions that actually and accurately represent the law and allow the, both parties to uh, argue the facts to the jury in some nation, it's an important task. It's a difficult task. And it's a complicated task. I remember covering the corruption trial of former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell. And being at this stage of jury instruction and the judge giving a wide berth for the, the jury, the Supreme Court ended up uh, uh, taking back that conviction. So you're right. Uh, 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 this is an extremely important stage, Chuck. Jeremy, let's go back now and talk about the testimony uh, that just wrapped up of Robert Costello. Obviously, uh, you know, there were some theatrics in the courtroom yesterday. Things calmed down today. Overall, was he an effective witness uh, for the defense? He, he could very well have been, could being the oper operative word here. Um, why? Because he became the sideshow. He became what we would expect of Donald Trump and what we expect of Michael Cohen, someone who loses his cool, loses his temperature, uh, you know, distracts. And that's what he did. If he would have been calm and collected and said, no, wait a second, Michael Cohen said to me, you know, inconsistently that, you know, he had nothing on the president. There was nothing to do with the president. The president was unaware in substance what he was getting at multiple times. Let's concentrate on that and leave it alone and not make this, you know, snide remarks. And from a guy who's a former federal prosecutor, you know, maybe he's not used to the trenches of, of actual Manhattan criminal court, which is vastly different. But this is not his first rodeo. So I'd be disappointed if I were the defense, and I'd be, I wouldn't say gleeful, but I would be happy the way it turned out if I were the prosecution. And if I just may, before you move on to a different topic, back to the jury instructions, yeah. what I think will be interesting, and I've really contemplated this for a while now, 
Will the judge say to the jury, you can consider what's called a lesser included offense, meaning that even though you only are asked initially to consider the felonies, you can consider the misdemeanor charge. And will the prosecution say, I don't want you to consider that. It's either all or nothing. And will the defense say, you know what? Maybe we don't want them either because if we get an acquittal and acquittal, we hang, we hang. Alternatively, if you convict on a misdemeanor, that's still, whether it's a home run or not, it's a definitely getting on base for the former president. Yeah, there's a lot at stake uh, at this stage of the trial. Chuck, let's go back to Robert Costello. Uh, obviously, the judge had to clear the courtroom yesterday. Uh, obviously, this was something that cable news and, and those of us that do this for a living talked about a lot because it was something exciting that happened in the courtroom. How big of an impact, though, will it have on the jury? It's much different than the perception uh, our viewers at home may have of how this trial's gone. Yeah, that's a fair question, Ryan, and a hard one to answer. I mean, the jurors have been around now for four, five, six weeks. I think I've lost count. Um, and so, you know, they're going to look at this holistically. My sense is that jurors take the instructions very seriously and they take their role seriously. And so while there was obviously, uh, you know, a, a bad moment for the defense and for Mr. Costello in the courtroom, um, and I think he sort of undercut any credibility that he had as a witness, uh, I'm not sure at the end of the day it matters. The jury will make their determination, will render their verdict, Ryan, based on the facts seduced at trial and, as we discussed, mm -hmm. on the law as instructed by the judge. And so it was interesting and it may have been somewhat salacious and, you know, it was certainly good fodder for the press. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way at all. But I'm not sure that it matters very much at the end of the day. The defense case um, was unavailing and unappealing, uh, and Mr. Costello certainly did not help it. Um, but whether or not he heard it, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay, to your point, though, Chuck, uh, we're now at uh, week six, I believe, of this trial, heading into week seven. Uh, those jurors have been sitting in that room for a long time. They have been consumed with a lot of information. How important is it now for the prosecution in their closing argument to connect all these dots that they've laid out over the course of this trial? Yeah, well, uh, on one hand, the jurors will be told, and properly so, that um, closing argument is not evidence. And it's not. It's simply argument. But on the other hand, it's the opportunity for both sides uh, to weave together all the facts that they think are helpful. And so as a former prosecutor, and by the way, I think both sides have a bit of a gift here in that they have several days to get their um, closing arguments together and to practice them. But what both sides will do will be to tell their story, their side, their version, drawing on facts helpful to them. The prosecution started out linearly and chronologically. I imagine they'll close the same way. They'll ask the jurors to draw certain inferences from the facts. They'll also show them documents that they adduced during trial. They may play additional clips for them that, that were adduced during trial. So the idea here is to knit it all together, Ryan, and then to argue that the evidence that the jurors saw only compels one outcome if you're a prosecutor, which is guilty as charged. So, Jeremy, who's got more pressure on them as we reach this stage, the, the prosecution or the defense? Well, I can only imagine the pressure in the room with Donald Trump when he's saying what the defense should be in summation and what he wants to hear. But I think the weight of this right now is really on Alvin Bragg. Uh, and, and it's not a weight that I, I would want on almost my worst enemy. I mean, justice isn't easy. You don't pursue a case because it's easy. You don't pursue a case because you think you'll just get a conviction. Sometimes those hardest cases you challenge and take are the ones that are the right ones. Now, that's up to, me, up to the jury in terms of what that outcome will be, if it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But this has a ripple effect that's going to be astronomical for the nation, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. And if there's an acquittal or a hung jury, he's going to be the, you know, he's going to hold the bag. Um, and, and it's a serious one. And that's not mean that it wasn't a righteous prosecution, but it's going to appear as such. So I think right now that heavy burden, that heavy weight is on Alvin Bragg. Yeah, I, sometimes I think we lose sight about just how historic the next couple of days are going to be and what this trial has been because we've been so consumed with it for such a long period of time. But it's going to have a long-lasting impact no matter what. Jeremy and Chuck, thank you both for your expertise. We appreciate it. Coming up, more legal drama surrounding the former president, this time in Arizona, where nearly a dozen so-called fake electors were just arraigned on charges they tried to overturn the 2020 election results. 
But first, the Biden campaign and the White House are slamming former President Trump for posting a video to his social media account suggesting that his victory will bring a, quote, unified Reich. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Turning now to a strange and arguably unsettling episode from the campaign trail as the Trump campaign tries to explain why the presumptive Republican presidential nominee posted a video on his Truth Social account suggesting his victory would bring a, quote, unified Reich. This image was part of a 30-second video shared by the former president, which showed hypothetical newspaper headlines if he wins, one of which included the phrase, a unified Reich, a term associated with Nazi Germany. Now, Trump has since taken down the video, and the campaign says it wasn't their creation, and that it was just reposted by a staffer who did not see the phrase. The Biden campaign put out two fiery statements denouncing the Trump campaign for posting the video, while tying it to other instances of Trump using language associated with Nazi Germany. And they also sent out a fundraising email on it. The White House also put out a statement criticizing the post, and President Biden is expected to address it at an event later today. Here's what we heard from Vice President Harris this afternoon while speaking to union workers in Philadelphia. Just yesterday, the former president of the United States, who praises dictators, who said there were very fine people on both sides in Charlottesville. Let's not forget, took to social media and highlighted language from Nazi Germany. Highlighted language from Nazi Germany. This kind of rhetoric is unsurprising coming from the former president, and it is appalling and we got to tell him who we are. Let's talk about it. Joining me on set is Molly Ball, senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal, Eugene Robinson, columnist for The Washington Post and an NBC News contributor, and Republican strategist Matt Gorman, who recently worked on Tim Scott's presidential campaign. So, Molly, uh, this is becoming a familiar refrain with the Trump campaign. They post something incendiary, borderline racist, then they say, well, it was an accident. Uh, you know, we didn't mean to do it. This was a staffer or a supporter's idea. But it's becoming a pattern, right? Let's take a look. Uh, back in November of 2022, Donald Trump dining with a white nationalist and Holocaust denier, Nick Fuentes, they said, well, he didn't know who he was. In the New York Times, uh, the story from October 3rd of 2023 uh, escalates in anti-immigrant rhetoric with poisoning the blood. November of 2023 calls his enemies vermin, echo echoing dictators like Hitler and Mussolini. And then, of course, this unified Reich uh, post from today. How long can he keep just excusing this away, or should we actually think that there's a purpose behind this? Honestly, I have a hard time getting excited about something like this when it does seem to be unintentional. I mean, it's impossible for me to imagine that Donald Trump personally was like editing a piece of clip art here and like going on Photoshop to put a subliminal message in here to like neo Nazis or something. It just doesn't make any sense. I think well, there are plenty of reasons that uh, many people consider Donald Trump a threat to democracy, starting with the fact that he tried to overthrow the government and didn't concede an election that he lost. But the idea that this is some kind of dog whistle or as the vice president said that he's highlighting language i mean it i i just think that in a lot of ways this sort of cheapens the actual uh threats that democracy faces to allege that this is some kind of serious threat but it, it's happened more than once right i mean it's not and it, we know that he's quite indiscriminate about the things he posts on social media and he posts all kinds of uh disturbing things and many and they're not and they're not very well vetted and the reason campaigns usually try to avoid that is because then you get news cycles like this where people are trying to to but but again, you don't need hidden meanings uh, to make the accusation that, that, that Trump, you know, may, be, may pose a threat to democracy. Well, that's uh, and that and that is definitely true. Um, but, you know, if you if you rob a bank and get caught, you don't get clemency by saying, well, but I rob banks all the time, <laughs> you know, and so he posts this, this stuff happens all the time. And we I think we get a little inured to it. We get a little, you know, OK, oh, that's you know, that's what Trump does. But I, I shouldn't the word Reich be a flashing giant red 
symbol for anybody, um, who, you know, who, who looks at that and who thinks about, gee, maybe this is something I ought to repost. I mean, it would jump out at me. I think it would jump out at most people. Mm -hmm. there, there's only one context in which that word is used in this country, and that's to refer to Nazi Germany. Uh, uh, Matt, uh, in a different era, would this have been a disqualifying error on behalf of a candidate? We've seen this before, though, with other candidates. We saw it with other candidates in the, earlier in the primary, too. Um, look, I think the biggest thing is, quite frankly, aside from this, and I'm glad he deleted it, which is actually rare. I was, I was actually yeah. surprised he deleted mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks to something. But also, you give the Biden-Harris campaign this entire news cycle, as you just teased out. President Biden's going to talk about this directly. So you're now that coverage is going to bleed in the next day. So look, if the election was held today, I think a lot of us would think that Trump is in a good position to win. But with days like this, you get the news cycle away from the fact that he just outraised Biden and you talk about this a lot. So they have to be very, very careful about these sorts of mistakes. I don't think at the end of the day it's going to really affect one vote based on, you know, this video in particular. Mm -hmm. But it gets a news cycle away from you. Yeah. Uh, Molly, I know your point is well taken uh, about you know, that th there wasn't something diabolical at play here. But this was a video that was created by one of his supporters that they kind of indiscriminately just reposted. And it reminds me of a line that Andrew Gillum used in his uh, race against Ron DeSantis, which he did lose back in 2018. I covered that campaign. And he said, I'm not calling Mr. DeSantis a racist. I'm simply saying that racists believe that he's a racist. I mean, what does it say about Trump's base of support that he has supporters creating videos like this? Well, I mean, this has been the case for a long time. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the entire several news cycles back in 2016 when he wouldn't disavow the support of, of David Duke. Trump has always run what I think we could charitably call a big tent campaign where he welcomes all kinds of unsavory people as long as they like him. And, you know, you, you, you talked earlier about how he, you know, praises all these authoritarians and dictators, and they know that if they suck up to him, he will repay them in kind, and that tends to be the basis of his foreign policy. I think that's a that's a much, much bigger issue than than a word in a, a what seems to have been a piece of stock art that somebody just slapped into a video for the imagery without really looking at it. And Eugene, the Biden campaign doesn't want to just let this go, right? Oh, no. I mean, no, obviously, no, no. I mean, it's an opportunity. Right. And so these, when, when one of these things comes along, you know, you 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 beat it until it's dead and then you keep beating it until the next <laughs> one comes along. So I, I'm sure, the, you know, they are. I mean, you saw Vice President Harris and president's going to talk about it. It's uh, sure they're going to make whatever hay they can. Now, I, I, again, as Matt said, I don't know how much hay there is to be made mm -hmm. um, from this one thing. But um, but I do agree with you that, yeah, it's, this is a new cycle when uh, I'm sure the Trump campaign would love to be talking about the fundraising numbers, mm -hmm. the quarterly or mm -hmm. monthly fund, fundraising numbers. Um, you know, Biden still has a whole lot more money in the bank. Mm -hmm. he's, not, he's not poor. But for this period, he got outraised by Trump, and that's what they would want to talk yeah. about. And, and they're talking about the unified right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point, right? You got, you got to piece days like this together if you're the Harris campaign or the, Bi or the, uh, the Biden campaign, because look, you're, you're in search of positive momentum somewhere. You just got a really tough April. Not only did you get out fundraised, but you had the, the campus protest. And so you need to start piecing together going on offense a little bit. So I think this could be a, you know something that they refer back to over and mm -hmm. over again, just because they sure. need something sure. to hang on to. Mm -hmm. Eugene, you mentioned the money. Let's, let's show where things stand right now uh, between the two sides uh, in terms of their total cash on hand between the Democratic National Committee and the Biden campaign. Uh, they're up to $146 million. The RNC and the Trump campaign is at $88 million. This was a better quarter for the Trump campaign, mm -hmm. as Eugene rightly points out, than, the, than they've had. But it's still a pretty significant deficit, Matt. And the Trump campaign is funneling a lot of that cash to his legal defense fund. Uh, you'd probably always rather be the campaign with more money, but is this how important is money going to be at the end of the day, especially when you have two candidates that are so well known? It, it will be. And I think, you know, now that the Trump campaign can really use the RNC's rules to eight raise at a, essentially, if you're a big dollar donor, maybe Ryan Nobles, now, now, uh, $800,000 a, a donation, which is a lot of money, but so that they can raise it at a, at a higher clip. Now, look, if you're getting doubled up on fundraising, that has an impact, but 30, 50 million, at some point, you just kind of lose the scale at a national rate. Mm -hmm. In a funny way, the races we talk the most about money, presidential campaigns, are, and oftentimes, when money's the least important, you're relying mm -hmm. on earned media, and then you would have, say, a Senate House race. Right. So, Molly, uh, we're seeing the, the beginning of the end here of this uh, initial Trump campaign, the hush, or I'm sorry, the trial, the hush money trial. I, I've sometimes, I just said it earlier, it feels like we've lost the gravity of an event like this. 
there's going to be a verdict. That verdict's going to come before the first presidential debate. Uh, Donald Trump's either going to be exonerated or potentially a convicted felon. What kind of impact could the verdict have on the direction of the race, if any at all? I would be surprised if it has a major impact, frankly. I mean, I think we see in polls that, that voters, uh, while they take this seriously, they are relatively inured to it. A lot of people seem to view it as old news. It, of course, has to do with his conduct before he was elected president. Uh, and, and, the, and, you know, it's not a big revelation to a lot of people that uh, Trump was a bit of a womanizer and maybe uh, engaged in a lot of sleazy dealings. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of this is just baked in. And we do see in polls that uh, there is some slice of the electorate that says that while they support Trump now, they would give it a second thought if he were convicted of a felony. I think that the way that Trump has steered the narrative around this case makes me doubt that that would actually happen just because he, I think, has very successfully messaged to his supporters that the idea, and there's he you know, has a lot of practice at this, uh, that, that he's been victimized by a witch hunt. And so I think, you know, it's going to be pretty far in the rearview mirror by the time we get to November. All right. Both your take quick before we go. Um, I think I think that's basically right. I mean, you know, some of the conduct did take place when he was in the White House. He was writing those checks, mm -hmm. and so um, uh, you know, you wonder if that could have any impact. Um, uh, but um, I don't think it's a. I, I don't right now. I don't think it's a huge deal. We'll see. You know, these, the, these voters they do what they want, right. and uh, some, sometimes we can't predict them. Yeah. All right. All right, Matt, I'm not going to let you wait. That's okay. You can tell me privately. I will. Follow <laughs> Gene and Matt. Thank you all for being here. Blame Melissa and my <laughs> Up next, Rudy Giuliani and 10 other Trump allies are arraigned on charges of conspiracy, forgery, and fraud tied to their alleged effort to overturn the 2020 election. We'll have more on that. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Nearly a dozen Trump allies were arraigned today in Arizona on charges related to their alleged involvement in a plan to overturn the state's 2020 election results. They all pled not guilty. Those arraigned today include Rudy Giuliani, who has actually served his summons in dramatic fashion outside of his 80th birthday party in Florida after alerting, eluding process servers for weeks. On Friday, Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays announced that Giuliani had been served a notice of his indictment. Just over an hour after, Giuliani taunted the AG for failing to find him in a now-deleted social media post. 18 people were indicted last month in connection with a plan to falsify cert the certification of that, or falsely, I should say, certify that Trump won in 2020, and former President Trump was named as an unindicted co-conspirator. Mr. Trump himself faces criminal charges in two other election interference cases. But despite those charges, he continues to repeat lies that he won the 2020 election and cast doubt on the, about the results of this coming November. Joining me now to talk about this is The Washington Post's Yvonne Winjet Sanchez, who's covering uh, voting issues in Arizona, and Bram Resnick, who's the political reporter and anchor for our NBC affiliate uh, in Phoenix. Thank you guys both for being here. So Yvonne, uh, 11 defendants arraigned today. When can we expect the rest of the arraignments and how quickly could this case move forward? Several of the defendants are going to appear early next month. Some of these things will probably stretch into sometime mid-June. I would not expect uh, this case to wrap up anytime soon. It's probably going to stretch on for a number of years. What was really interesting about today was the schedule that the commissioner laid out for all of the defendants. It is lining up right along with that election schedule and is definitely going to keep this elector case front and center of, you know, the electorate psyche ahead of this expected rematch between Trump and Biden. And we mentioned uh, Giuliani's summons this weekend that impacted his release conditions. What, what did the judge rule? Yeah, so Giuliani was the only defendant that state prosecutors sought conditions for. They wanted $10,000 cash bond. Uh, the judge issued basically a, an assurance bond. Um, he will have to go through a bail bondsman, find some other form to um, basically ensure that he is going to appear before the court. He also must appear within the next 30 days in Maricopa County for his booking procedures. And obviously this follows this odyssey um, that we've tracked over the last three weeks where state prosecutors tried time and again through multiple phone calls, visits to his New York apartment, 
matching, you know, a real estate listing for his old apart, you know, for his apartment with the background that is featured in his social media posts, repeated attempts to try to get him, finally catching up with him late on Friday at his 80th birthday party. Well, he was live streaming that birthday party, we should point out. Uh, Yvonne, among those indicted in this case are current Arizona lawmakers. So give us a sense of how what's going on in the state Republican Party there. And what does it mean for state house politics at a time when state lawmakers have been garnering more national attention? Look, this is an issue that we've been dealing with nonstop for the past three and a half, four years. I feel like the rest of the country is just sort of catching up to sort of the denialism and the skepticism towards the 2020 outcome that has really sort of ripped and only deepened in Arizona over the last several years. I don't think this really changes anything at the state house other than perhaps giving and elevating a platform now, a, a courtroom platform, cameras, reporters showing up to all of these events uh, for some of these people to state their case in a sort of reasoned fashion. Um, I do think that there will be a continued, perhaps um, more to be learned sort of conversation around the knowledge of some of the electors who will tell you that they just did what they were told. They were hearing from really important people from the national level, from attorneys who seemed to know what they were doing, from the leader of their own party who was summoning them down there and telling them what to do. And there seems to be sort of a disconnect between what those people might have known and what the middlemen nationally and here in Arizona. Okay, Yvonne, thanks for that. I know you're on deadline, so let's move over and talk to Bram about it from his perspective. Uh, Bram, the indictment includes many Trump allies. The former president himself is an unindicted co-conspirator. What does this tell us about Trump's influence over the Arizona Republican Party? Well, if you see the elections uh, playing out today, the primaries, for example, uh, red district in, on the west side of Maricopa County, uh, Donald Trump has endorsed one candidate there and that endorsement likely counts for a lot although it will have to see how that shakes out because the candidate he endorsed right now is in second in polling in that district against the guy Donald Trump endorsed in the last cycle like Blake Masters versus Abe Hamadas but it still seems Trump has a hold on the party we are seeing some fractures here and there in local districts certainly Democrats think they can crack some of those districts and take control of the state legislature for the first time in about half a century. Um, so there are some fractures showing in specific places. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, are, are voters paying attention to this case? Are they are they concerned about the fake electors? Uh, and, and is it resonating with them? Or is this not one of the top issues that uh, voters are taking with them when they go to vote? Well, if you see what voters rank as their top issues, democracy for Democrats is quite high. Does a fake elector's story fit into that? Perhaps uh, I have to keep reminding myself as a journalist that all this happened three and a half years ago and keep reminding myself to tell folks, here's what happened and what they're accused of doing, because in this environment, the news flies by so quick. To many, it is very important. And I think as more information comes out, information that was reported two years ago or so, uh, they might get more engaged. And, you know, I'd add about Rudy Giuliani in particular. This, what happened today is significant because if you look at the, the emails that have been released, if the, the voice messages we have, it is clear Rudy Giuliani played a central role in bringing the scheme together. And at one point, according to the emails, even holding it together, when Kelly Ward, the former chair of the Arizona Republican Party, thought for a moment that she might be committing treason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, again, that's in one of the emails, and that's likely to come up again uh, as we get to trial. I would agree with Yvonne that the trial is a long way away. Yeah. So, uh, Bram, there's a new poll of Arizona voters that shows nearly half of Republican voters believe the election results should be challenged and investigated if President Biden wins. These are, this is the upcoming election, not the one that already happened. Are officials in Arizona prepared for a similar scheme to unfold in 2024? Are they hoping that maybe this indictment serves as a deterrent? 
Uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, they are not hoping this indictment serves as a deterrent. They think it's an important step to take to hold people accountable. At the same time, they are preparing for much of what we saw in 2020 for the possibility that could happen again. Challenges to the elections. I, you saw what that poll says. That's half the Republican electorate, if you believe the poll, but it doesn't have to even be that much. Uh, we do know our top elections officials are pre preparing for challenges and maybe even worse uh, as the results come out on election night. All right, Bram, uh, excellent perspective. I appreciate you so much for being on. Thanks for that. And you know what, we, you. Like, you know what we like to say around here? If it's Tuesday, voters are voting somewhere. And today those somewheres are California, Oregon, Idaho, Kentucky, and Georgia. We've got our eyes on California, where Capitol Hill Republicans are set to pad their slim majority by filling Kevin McCarthy's former seat. Republicans Vince Fong and Mike Boudreau are vying to finish out McCarthy's term. Once either one is sworn in, the House Republicans will have 218 members versus the Democrats 213, meaning Republicans will have room for two defectors if the full House votes. Wide margin. Another place we're watching is Oregon and three closely contested House primaries. That includes the 5th District, a toss-up contest which could ultimately decide which party controls Congress. Two Democrats are squaring off to unseat the first-term Republican Congresswoman Lori Chavez-Dermer. The Democrats' congressional campaign arm is backing State Representative Janelle Bynum over Jamie McLeod Skinner, who lost the seat by two points back in 2022. After the break, massive crowds gather to mourn the death of Iranian President Raisi as the Iranian regime and the world grapple with what's next at a precarious time for the entire Middle East region. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. Thousands of mourners gathered in northwest Iran as the country grapples with the sudden death of its president, Iriham Raisi. Funeral processions began early today, less than two days after the helicopter crash which killed Raisi, along with Iran's foreign minister. You can see here the crowds dressed in black filling the street, some carrying flags and flowers for the late president, as they walked alongside the truck carrying the coffins of the eight people who died in the crash. Raisi's body was then flown to Tehran, where additional prayers and a burial procession are scheduled. Joining me now is NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons. He's reporting from the Gulf region. Uh, Keir, uh, Tehran has declared five days of national mourning. What can we expect for Raisi's funeral services in Tehran? Yeah, five days of national mourning and three days just of the funeral, as you uh, mentioned. Uh, Raisi's body and those of the other officials, including the foreign minister who were killed in the, in the crash, now in Tehran. And then the day after that, he will be moved to his hometown where, where he will be buried. I mean, those scenes that we've seen through the day today, really in, impactful. Like, huge crowds of people in the town of, in the city of Tabriz. That is the place, a city close to where the the crash happened. Uh, you saw people holding up pictures of the late president. You saw them reaching out to try to touch uh, the coffin, many in tears. There are, of course, not in these pictures, many Iranians who were opposed to the late president, who uh, disagree with what he had to say. And we actually have uh, heard interviews uh, from our uh, partner network, Sky News, with uh, people inside Iran who are saying that in other areas, people have been handing out sweets to celebrate the fact that he has passed because many protests have been crushed. To underscore the ruthlessness, the continuing ruthlessness of the Iranian uh, regime, uh, Ryan, the, the prosecutor there telling people that anyone who is seen celebrating uh, or marking the death of President Raisi in a positive light uh, would be pursued. So uh, in a way you could just say about that, nothing has changed despite the death of the Iranian president. And the constitution in Iran says that the country must hold elections within 50 days. What can we expect? Who will be the candidates and, and what will voter turnout look like? Well, it depends who you ask about an Iranian election, but most 
in the West uh, and uh, in Washington would say that it, it's not much of an election, to, to be honest. Uh, the election that appointed President Raisi uh, was uh, one where only the candidates that were approved by the Supreme Leader could take part. We don't know who the candidates will be this time, uh, but it will be very similar to that. It's going to happen in, in late June. The interim president himself is a hardliner and, and took a phone call from President Putin very quickly. The Kremlin emphasizing how many times President Putin and, and the now interim president have met in the past. He is someone who went to Russia uh, last year to negotiate weapons for Russia in its fight against Ukraine. So uh, we will see candidates, but again, maybe not a change in Iran's direction. Okay, Keir Simmons, thank you for that report. We appreciate it. Turning now to the continued fallout after prosecutors at the International Criminal Court announced that they were seeking arrest warrants for top Israeli and Hamas officials for war crimes against humanity. It is an issue that has divided the West, with some European countries, including France and Germany, expressing support for the ICC and its independence. But here in Washington, the Biden administration continues to make clear it opposes the ICC's latest actions. Contrary to allegations against Israel made by the International Court of Justice, what's happening is not genocide. We reject that. The extremely wrongheaded decision by the uh, ICC prosecutor yesterday, the shameful equivalence implied uh, between Hamas and the leadership of Israel, we'll uh, be happy to work with uh, Congress, with this committee, uh, on an appropriate response. Joining me now is Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill. We saw Secretary Blinken there. He was testifying today, and he signaled the administration may take some action against the ICC. What would that look like? Yeah, that's right, Ryan. This was a revealing moment where the ICC's action actually unified the Biden administration and Democrats with Republicans on this issue uh, as they had been kind of been moving further and further apart, unified them in condemnation. You just played uh, Blinken over there calling this an extremely wrongheaded decision. He described the shameful equivalence in his words between Hamas and, uh, and, and the government of Israel. He said this sets back the cause of a ceasefire in Gaza and it makes it harder to get a, a hostile release deal. Now, Blinken told the ranking member of this committee in his testimony, Jim Risch, that he could support uh, legislative action against the ICC. He said, quote, we want to work with you on a bipartisan basis to find an appropriate response, unquote. But Secretary Blinken, ever the diplomat, said the devil's in the details and he would need to see a proposal before he commits to it. His message to the committee was essentially, show us what you got. We'll take it from there. But we agree on the broader point. Of course, Sahil, the U.S. policy on Israel is really a dividing line, it's dividing the country on both sides of the aisle. Was the secretary able to say anything to minimize some of those criticisms? Yes, somewhat, Ryan. Interestingly, in that exchange with uh, Jim Risch, Risch seemed to like the fact that he talked about that shameful equivalence. He said that coinage was, quote, a good starting point for all of us. That is Risch talking to uh, Blinken and said he also wants to work with him. Now, of course, there are Republicans who are not satisfied with Blinken or the administration. That includes uh, conservative Senator Ted Cruz, who had a fiery exchange with uh, Secretary Blinken, demanding to know that, uh, you know, whether the Biden administration was withholding any intel about Hamas from Israel, to which Blinken categorically insisted, no, it is not, and that reports to the contrary in Blinken's uh, words were false. Their speaker, Mike Johnson, said uh, if the administration doesn't show leadership, Congress will consider uh, any and all options, including sanctions to punish uh, the ICC and ensure that its leadership faces consequences if they proceed. And then, of course, on the progressive side, the protests continue. Secretary Blinken faced yet another protest in that room uh, from people calling him war criminal and complicit in Aside. Finally, progressive Senator Bernie Sanders actually said the ICC is right, that the uh, arrest warrants may never materialize, but international law must be abided by. Ryan. Okay, Sahil Kapoor on top of all of it for us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Still to come, in a state where abortions are already illegal, lawmakers are now looking to go even further to restrict, restrict access. We're live in Louisiana where lawmakers are considering classifying abortion pills as controlled substances. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Lawmakers in Louisiana are just beginning debate on a bill that would, in some instances, criminalize the possession of two medical abortion pills, Mifepristone and Misopristol. 
Under the proposed legislation, both medications would be reclassified as a Schedule IV drug, and possession without a prescription would become punishable under law by up to 10 years in prison. Abortions in Louisiana are already banned, with no exceptions for rape or incest. If this legislation passes, it would be the first attempt to restrict the use of abortion pills by classifying them as controlled substances, potentially opening up another front in the abortion fight. NBC's Marissa Parra joins me now from Baton Rouge. So, Marissa, how did this legislation come about, and, and what are lawmakers hoping to accomplish with this bill? Okay, hey, Ryan. Well, our timing is perfect because they actually just started debating this. Um, it started within the last couple of minutes. So hopefully we will get an update on how lawmakers are going to vote on this soon. Um, but in terms of how it started, in terms of uh, the, the story there, we know that this was authored by State Senator Thomas Presley. And you might have heard a little bit about the story behind that. He said that his sister had been given abortion pills without her consent, without her knowledge by her now ex-husband. And this caused her complications during her pregnancy, uh, not just to her, but also to the life of her child that she eventually birthed. And so this bill originally started as with the intention to make coerced abortions illegal and punishable because um, 180 days was the sentencing that her ex-husband was given. And so State Senator Thomas Presley said that was simply not enough. So I want to take you to him, an interview we did with him this morning, and then I'll explain more on the other side. The goal certainly is to not uh, provide uh, a, an additional uh, challenge to our medical providers, but it is to ensure that these drugs are being used uh, appropriately and effectively for legitimate medical reasons which are outside of abortion. Uh, as I've, I've stated previously, abortion is already illegal in Louisiana. I'm not changing that at all. So I want to explain some of what we're hearing from people on both sides here. Uh, we're hearing from not just uh, people on both sides of the abortion rights debate, but also some physicians. And I want to explain that quickly because I know we're almost out of time here, Ryan, but there was an open letter signed by nearly 300 physicians within the state of Louisiana because, as you heard, he said this isn't about abortion access to begin with because, as we talked about, there's a near total ban here. And so you can't use these drugs, and specifically mifepristone and misoprostol. You cannot use them for abortions, but you can can use those drugs for other medical purposes. And so physicians who signed this letter, including Dr. Avegna, who we spoke with earlier, was saying she says this is, quote, bad science because this is going to put pressure on physicians around here in terms of decision making that needs to happen. Because we talked about uh, other uses for these drugs. They're used for delivery purposes. They're used in other ways other, uh, other than for abortions, Ryan. And so that's something that they're trying to get out there and provide flare clarification from. But um, abortion rights activists are saying this is another way way to control and restrict access to these pills, particularly with concern from people against abortion rights who are saying that these are being mailed in and it's become too easy. So it really depends on how you're looking at this. But in terms of that vote we just talked about, it looks like that may not be happening, Ryan. So we might have to wait a little longer to find out the fate of this bill as it stands right now. Okay. Thank you for the update, Marissa Parra. We appreciate that. And it is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. That's the month of May, which celebrates and recognizes the contributions of the AAPI community here in the United States. But it's also an opportunity to reflect on some of the darker days in this country's history, including in the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, when the U.S. incarcerated more than 100,000 people of Japanese descent, including many Japanese Americans, forcing them to leave their homes and give up their property. Now, one of those internment camps has opened its doors as one of the country's newest national parks. NBC's Emily Akeda filed this report from Camp Amachi in Colorado. This is pretty high brush. For the first time, Hideko Hamamoto is returning to her birthplace, Amachi, a Japanese incarceration camp that held innocent families seen as threats for merely looking like the enemy in World War II. 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans within four months were put into barracks. I mean, how does that happen? Today, the foundations of the barracks remain in Grenada, Colorado. Okay. Mm -hmm. Along with fragments of daily life, marbles, tin cans from 80 years before. Photos show a young Hideko playing with a tin can turned toy. Enduring the unthinkable with dignity. Now she's walking those grounds again alongside her daughter and granddaughter. It's a little emotional. 
they should have been protected by the government who instead incarcerated them. I think that being here kind of reminded me um, of the connection that it has to the present and to like who I really am. And it's not just some kind of isolated, separate era. It's a feeling I share. You know, my grandfather used to share, he had this vivid memory of a child where he would look through the barbed wire, he would look up at the armed guards as an eight-year-old boy and wonder, why am I here? For decades, survivors like Bob Fuchigami have pushed for Amachi to become a national historic site. This year, those efforts were officially realized. It's one thing to talk about, it's, it's another to actually be on the grounds, think about being placed there. Continuing a decades-old tradition, hundreds descended on the site over the weekend to remember those who endured and have since passed. There was a breeze coming through, and it was almost as if they were saying, well, thank you for being here, and don't let this happen again. It's important to remember. Emily Iketa, NBC News, Grenada, Colorado. We're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.